Okay, let's talk a few minutes about how to confirm that the endotracheal tube we've placed is placed in the correct spot. So this is the standard of care. This is certainly uh, not an all-inclusive, but the most important pieces of tube confirmation are presented in this slide. So the absolute best thing we can do to confirm tube placement is to actually visualize the tube passing through the vocal cords. So visualization is the absolute best indicator. This is something you should strive for each and every time. And I appreciate that some patients' anatomy is simply not going to allow you to do that. Um, then maybe we shouldn't be intubating. The goal here is that uh, intubation is not a blind procedure, meaning that we don't just drop the tube down and hope that it went in the right place, and then we bag a little bit and we do some of these other things to ensure that the, that the tube actually is in the trachea. The goal here is that visualization is absolutely the most imperative piece uh, to, uh, to the confirmation of tube placement, and you should not attempt blind intubation sticks. All right, the next thing is once you see the tube go through the cords, we want to apply an end tidal CO2 detector device. During the early phases of confirmation, using an easy cap, which is the colorimetric device, that's the one with the piece of litmus paper um, that's, uh, that's purple and yellow. So uh, we want to use a colorimetric device generally early on. That gives us a, a definitive yes or no, a very quick thing. Remember that the color metric device is not designed for continuous use. It's designed for early tube placement confirmation. So you use it for 30 seconds and then you're done with it. You put something else on there. The preferred method of continuous or ongoing evaluation of tube confirmation is waveform capnography. So we'll talk more about that when we get to the LifePak 15 usage and some of the monitoring devices that we have available to us. But waveform capnography is absolutely, uh, is absolutely imperative here. So that's the second piece. Next, we want to listen. We want to auscultate first over the high-risk areas. So we want to listen over the stomach first. We listen over the stomach because if, in fact, we're in the esophagus, we want to catch that quickly. So we want to do a little bit of a puff of air with bag valve. We want to see if we have any bubbles or any sound over the epigastric area. If we do, then we're probably not in the right place. So we have to be careful with that. All right? So we're going to auscultate first over the belly, then we're going to listen over into the, uh, over the lung fields. I like to listen over the left lung fields first, and then the right again. Uh, if we've pushed the tube down a little bit too far, the majority of the time we will be in the right main stem bronchus. And so if we listen to the left first and we don't hear lung sounds, it's probably because we have a right main stem innovation if actually we're in the trachea. So we look, we make sure it goes through the cords, we put a colorimetric device, we get a quick confirmation, we convert over to waveform capnography, we listen over the belly, we listen over the lungs. The next thing we want to evaluate on an ongoing basis is the bag valve compliance. Remember that once you put the trachea, the tube inside the trachea and you connect a bag valve mask to the, uh, or a bag valve to the tube, we now have a closed circuit. So any pressure that you put in the bag should be equal to the pressure that ends up in the lungs. So anytime you have a tremendous amount of resistance, if there's a lot of pressure in the bag and you're having difficulty with chest rise, this is called poor bag valve compliance. This is going to be a concern to us because we don't know why that's the case. We're going to, in some cases, it might be the patient. The patient might have stiff lungs or it might be something that we've done. It might be a malfunction. It might be that the patient has a, a pneumothorax. There are all sorts of things. We'll discuss uh, those things at, in greater detail at a later time. But bag valve compliance is something you want to be aware of. So if you're bagging patient, uh, the patient and the bag uh, becomes more difficult to bag as you go on, something's wrong. All right, next thing we're going to look is for chest rise. If you put in 500 cc's of air, you should see the chest rise that equal amount as well. So instead of using numbers here, it's going to make sense that any time that you push air in, there should be chest rise that's consistent with the amount of air that you put in as well. Remember, any time we're bagging the patient, we are increasing pressure inside the chest, which is a bad thing for patients in cardiac arrest. It decreases venous return. It produces uh, vagal stimulation. It, uh, it causes bradycardia, and it causes hypotension. So be aware of that. We just want to get a nice, easy ventilation with the minimum amount of volume that we need to achieve oxygenation. So a little bit of chest rise, and then we let the bag go. So we want to do it over a nice, long period of time, one to two seconds. 
Also, is the patient's color getting better? If the patient is intubated and they are perfusing, it should go from a blue or mottled color to a much more pink, at least in the central torso area, than, uh, than when we started. Right. Also, is there tube fogging? Remember, the esophagus doesn't have, it's not humidified, and there's no air moving through it. So when you're in the esophagus, you don't get tube fogging generally. When you're in the trachea, you generally do. Right. Remember, if we see an increase in SpO2, if we started at 50%, let's say, because the patient was apneic and hypoventilating, um, once we get ventilation going a little bit and we start to perfuse them a little bit, once that happens, perhaps we can see a jump in the SpO2. Remember, if you have a patient in asystole, though, or a patient that's not perfusing at all, looking at uh, the amount of oxygen that's in their blood is not going to work for us because that's still going to be low no matter what we do. It's not a definitive indicator of, of endotracheal tube placement. All right, and the last but not least is mental status. Um, and this could go either way. You could have a patient that's completely unresponsive and unconscious because they are hypoxemic. Now that you've intubated them and you're ventilating and oxygenating them, they may become awake. So they may become combative. Conversely, you can have a patient whose mental status goes from the combative state of, uh, of hypoxemia to a more calmed and relaxed state once they're intubated, once they're oxygenated, once they're being ventilated. So this can go either way, but a change in mental status is perhaps what you're looking for here. So these are the, the key concepts, the key indicators of endotracheal tube placement confirmation, and it is important for you to continuously evaluate uh, that the tube is still in the right place as you're transporting, as we're moving the patient, as they're bumping up and down, as they're uh, combative. We really need to make sure that the endotracheal tube is still in the trachea and hasn't dislodged to anywhere else. All right, that's it for now.